For the last example, I'm going to look at a more complicated paper or complicated example. Um, and this is on a traffic trauma paper. Now I've put a link to the whole paper here on traffic offences and trauma and they also made their data publicly available so I've put a link to their data in SPS format as well. So the primary outcome in this case is whether or not there was an admission to the ICU or there was a death and this is counted as a serious accident. So the primary outcome is, was the accident serious, yes or no? And the primary explanatory variable is, were there any prior traffic offences? So prior traffic offences could be categorical as yes or no, or it could be count in, in the number of the offences. In this case, we're gonna look at it as being categorical. Uh, in the flow chart they give us in the paper, it is a yes or a no, and later on in the paper, they use it as a count variable. So if we do a bar chart and look at the proportions of whether or not there is a difference in the seriousness of the offence um, and whether or not the driver had a prior traffic offence, this is probably not the best graph to use. We've got difference in sample sizes, so that might be easier to read as a percentage. Um, but we can just plug those numbers into uh, a table in Open Epi to get the analysis out if we were interested in that without controlling for any other variables. So this would be a basic chi-squared test and we'd put in the numbers who had the admission to ICU or death and the ones who had the prior traffic offence. And the p-value is very, very low. So we've got very strong evidence against the null hypothesis and evidence that there is an association between whether or not you had a prior traffic offence and the seriousness of the accident. And we could do that in SPSS as well, and we'll get a similar output. So the odds that a person who is admitted to the ICU after an accident had a prior offence is uh, 6.86 to 1. So if for every one person admitted to the ICU or who was dead after an accident who did not have a prior traffic offence, there were nearly seven who did have a prior traffic offence. So that is really, really high. Now the question is, is this whole effect down to prior traffic offences or are other variables contributing to this um, which we need to account for? So if I open up the data in SPSS, we can have a look at their variables and obviously they've described these in the paper so you can read that as well. So if we were just taking a novice look at this data, we might think about what could be also involved with the, the uh, seriousness of an accident. Alcohol, to my mind, would likely be a contributor, perhaps the age of the driver, perhaps years of driving experience, but would this really matter if we have already controlled for age? I don't know. And could gender play a part? And so if we were putting all these into a logistic regression, it's quite easy. We just um, lump them all in. The only thing to, to note in this case is that we do have to tell SPSS whether the variables we're putting in are continuous or categorical because it has to deal with them in different ways. Just grabbing my pointer. So you can see here that gender it has interpreted as a categorical variable and had alcohol in the last 12 hours that will also be categorical, yes or no. Licence time in years would be continuous. Total number of traffic offences, in this case we're using it as a continuous variable, not a count variable, and age in years also. Now if it gets any of these wrong, and we'll see this in the workshops, we'll just come up to the categorical button up there and fix that up. But our primary outcome is still this binary outcome of yes or no as to whether or not the accident resulted in a death or ICU admission. So, if we have a look at the results here, there's quite a lot going on. The first thing that we might look at when we're beginning with this is to think about the significance of each variable. So it looks like here that gender is not significant and actually license is not significant once we have, if we have included these other variables in the model and that's really important to note that whether or not a variable is significant or not will change depending on what else you adjust for in the model. So if we took out some of these variables, we might then find that these popped up as being significant. But at the moment, it looks like gender and um, 
it says license in year prior to trauma that must be the number of years you've had your license prior to the trauma they're not important once we have adjusted for these others then the next part we would be interested in is the the exponential beta column which gives us the odds ratio or the the increase or decrease in odds based on this variable which is significant and it gives us confidence interval 2 Sometimes it can be a little tricky to work out what this that adjustment in odds is for. I'll just go back to the previous page again. So if we had a look at had alcohol in the last two hours, uh, sorry, 12 hours, which is significant and it gives us an increase in the odds of having a serious tra traffic offence, we might be able to guess that that increase in odds is for the yes you did have alcohol rather than the no you didn't but we can also work that out from the analysis because in a lot of cases it's not clear so if I just um, walk over here and just show you this little bit here it's got a little one in brackets so what it has done with a categorical variable it's given each level a code and it said if it's got this code of one after it then that's what this increase in odds relates to. So I'll go back up to the next page now and this is where we get again I need to be able to run and I can't here we see the one in brackets and that's referring to yes has had alcohol in the last 24, uh, 12 hours, I can't seem to keep my hours straight, and the zero is your reference level no. So that's the adjustment for yes, which is an increase, I think it was about 1.3, it, it is an increase in the odds of having a serious traffic offence. So gender was not significant, years of having a licence was not significant after controlling for the other variables. Total number of traffic offences is significant re related, alcohol is and age is. So there are a couple of things that can happen when you're doing a multivariate analysis as compared with a univariate analysis and that is that if we test these variables one at a time they may all appear significant but they may not all be important at the same time. So if we had run a separate analysis on each of these variables we could have potentially found that each one of them was significant by itself and the benefit of doing the multivariate analysis is that we can look at whether they actually all matter together. So I did actually go through and just run the analysis for gender and if all you look at is gender in the model and you don't include anything else, I'll just get out of the way, you can see there that the it is significant and that it is an increase in the odds, so presumably that's for males. But if we control for age drinking and prior offences, then gender itself no longer has much of an impact. So to me I think what this is saying is that statistically young men are more likely to take risks which we know from a whole lot of research but targeting young men wouldn't necessarily be the best focus because it wouldn't address the other behaviours of people who are at risk and essentially the gender itself doesn't matter after we target, after we think about those other risky behaviours. So the question is, is this a case of a confounding variable? And it's probably not, and that might be a little bit confusing, but if you remember that a confounding variable is where we have a variable which is potentially related to both the outcome and the exposure. So our very first example was looking at heart disease and physical activity and is age a confounder and it can be because age is related to physical activity but it's also independently related to heart disease but in this case given this data and I'm not an expert in the area so I'm happy to be contradicted it doesn't actually look like gender itself is directly related to a serious offence it's just that there are some risky behaviours associated particularly with young males which then leads to the prior traffic offences which then leads to a serious offence so it's part of a causal pathway, it's not some independent risk factor for a serious traffic offence. So in this case we wouldn't consider it to be a confounding variable. 
So that's one thing that can happen with a multivariate analysis is that things um, no longer appear significant once we've controlled for other variables. Now also the reverse can happen. It may appear that by itself that a variable is not important, but once we have adjusted for other things, we realise that it is, but perhaps the effect is quite small and we can't pick it up until we adjust for other variables. And this is what we saw in the coffee and the carcinoma paper, where looking at it by itself, the effect of coffee was not significant. Um, and that they don't have a p-value there, but you can see that the, the odds ratio crosses one. But then once we had adjusted, I say we, meaning the people in the paper, obviously, once they had adjusted for all these other variables, now the effect of coffee was significant and it was a reduction in the odds of getting um, the cancer. So if there are several variables which are contributing to an outcome, then it's best to, to test them all together. So that is the best practice, is to use a multivariate analysis rather to, than to run lots of separate univariate analyses. Um, it does become a bit trickier when there are several outcomes of interest and obviously we're not covering that in this course. If we were looking a bit further into the results of the traffic trauma paper, we might try doing a few graphs. We've got a whole lot of variables going on here and it's difficult to look at more than three um, at a time. So I did a, try to couple out to try and look at it here. Um, so I've got the mean age in years and it actually looks like the older people are having more serious traffic offences, but I think this is because they've had more time, sort of more chances to have a serious traffic offence because they've been driving for longer. Um, prior traffic offences is a yes or a no. No is in blue and yes is in um, green. And then we've got the death or the ICU, no and yes here. So I'm not convinced that this is a, a great way to look at this data but I had to play around and tried another graph as well. In this case I had a look at the total number of traffic offences and this is quite interesting just because of how many there are. So the total number of traffic offences before the trauma that they're looking at in this paper and some people have had uh, 40 prior traffic offences. Uh, and in this case the person did not have a serious offence so they did not end up in the in the ICU, that's a no, and all the green ones were the serious ones. So there's so much data here, we really can't see what is going on at all. So sometimes these graphs are interesting and they help point out some interesting features of the data, not necessarily the easiest for interpreting the results. So in the paper, what they did was, um, as with most papers on logistic regression, they presented the models in a table and they give us the odds ratios um, for whether or not each particular variable, so you can look and see if it increased or decreases the odds of the outcome, which is a serious traffic offence. And then this is the type of thing that we might put into just a simple graph of odds ratios like I looked at in the lecture. So if we're looking at model three perhaps, where they've adjusted for the most number of variables and looking to see what's significant, they found that age was significant um, being male, not quite significant. Duration of holding a driver's license was. And then if we look down here for the, the type of traffic offence, hopefully we can see that what gave the biggest increase to the odds of having a serious traffic offence was drink driving. And after that, what's the next highs? Oh, seatbelt. And, oh, the Hoon Law, okay handhold electronic devices, so there's a few interesting ones in there, but drink driving by far giving you the, the highest risk of a serious traffic offence. Um, I had a big play with this data, it's quite interesting. I couldn't quite get exactly their results, so I'm not entirely sure what they did with this, but I did get very, very similar results. Um, if you're having trouble understanding those tables, then I would come back to the paper and have a read through there outcomes and they do a nice job here of actually listing their primary outcome. They give a whole section to it and they talk about the the effect of the prior traffic offences um, on the seriousness of the offence and then in conclusion they say prior traffic offences were a significant risk factor 
particularly for the alcohol-related road trauma. So that's where they've adjusted for whether or not the traffic offences were um, due to alcohol. I think I have just a... Oh no, that's the end. I don't have any more of the results. But you can link through to that full paper if you want to read through. Um, and if you were presenting those results then for a project, I think this might be where perhaps you would choose the model you thought was the most useful and give us a graph of the odds ratios and then that would be clear which ones were significant due to whether or not they crossed that one threshold. And perhaps as an exercise, you could have a go at taking this table and even just sketching up on a bit of paper what these odds ratios might look like in a graph.